Well, whenever I started this giant Gettysburg series, I started having several people sending me messages telling me that I needed to stop by the Gettysburg Museum of History. Well, funny story. Last night, I was staying right here at the Federal Point Inn and uh, happened to run into Eric Dorr, who runs the Gettysburg Museum of History. He invited me to come out today and uh, spend some time looking at, at all the, the different artifacts that they have there at the museum. I've heard tons of great things. And uh, yeah, gonna head down to downtown Gettysburg and uh, see what we can learn. just got in here into the Gettysburg Museum of History and holy smokes we are going to need a few videos uh, to get through this thing I've never seen anything like this in my life and and here is the man who is behind this amazing collection this is Eric Dorr he, he's gonna kind of walk us through this museum and like I said this, this is gonna take a few videos to get through All right, JD, I want to show you a couple of neat things in here. I'm going to give you a quick walk through. Uh, the first thing that comes to, to vision here is uh, General Warren's hat. This is an actual Civil War General's hat, and it belonged to General Warren, who's famous for his, uh, his uh, activity on Little Round Top, and they have a monument to him up there. And this came directly from the family back in the 1960s. And uh, also looking at this case, I, I, I love the Confederate math book that has actual story problems about killing Yankee soldiers. Oh my gosh. If one Confederate soldier can kill 90 Yankees, how many Yankees can 10 Confederate soldiers kill? So it's, it's, a, it's a really fantastic piece. Um, coming over here, we have a belt buckle that was hit by a bullet. Now this is actually from a man named Michael Miller who was in Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves. They are the famous unit that fought here at Gettysburg. And he wrote a letter to his wife about this event. It says, a ball struck me on the plate on my waist belt. It bruised me a good deal, but I thank God it struck there for had it not hit the belt plate, I would this day be in the ground for it would have gone through my bowels. So this is a belt buckle that literally saved this guy's life. Coming over here, we have a bunch of artifacts from various spots on the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, you know, each plate is an area, and this is reminiscent of the old museums here at Gettysburg, where they, there was lots of small private museums that would have little plates full of relics, because they didn't really have good glass cases back then, I guess. And a lot of people who came here in the you know in the 50s and 60s will remember this kind of display, and we kind of made this this collection. Uh, like a throwback kind of situation. And I want to show you this picture right here. This is Wesley Culp, the famous Gettysburg rebel. He actually moved away from Gettysburg and to, down to Virginia to work in the carriage industry and he joined a local militia there. And uh, when the war broke out, he joined the Confederate Army. And his brother, uh, William Culp, was in the 87th PA. So we talk about the Civil War being brother against brother. Well, this is a, a case where it literally was brother against brother. They actually faced each other in battle. So coming over here, this is a real Confederate frock coat, one of my favorite pieces. Confederate uniforms are extremely rare. And uh, this is a lieutenant's co coat. And we have another coat here. This is a lieutenant's coat from um, uh, Governor Warren's brother, Edgar. and. Uh, it, and a sword and a sash. Um, coming over here, we have the Pepper Collection. Um, the Pepper Collection is what got me started in, in the relic uh, um, collecting phase of my life, and it started when I was about five years old. My grandfather had all kinds of neat artifacts from the Gettysburg Battlefield, and I would come up there um, to his house, which is actually this house. My grandfather lived in this house. And um, I would play with these relics, and I became fascinated with objects, especially this pistol right here, which was in his den. And I used to play with it when I was a kid, and just like look at it. And I had I had this 
thought that, oh my gosh, a Civil War soldier actually touched this object, and I, I was fascinated. You know, five years old, playing with a Civil War pistol, it was, it's, it's what ignited my passion. Um, but anyway, this stuff all came from the Pepper Farm, and their farm was near Ziegler's Grove, if you're familiar with that. It's like the Union right flank of Pickett's Charge. This is a very fascinating item. This is a relic pyramid. It was made by a guy named F. Hayes Delaney in 1896, and he attached relics to this obelisk and labeled every one of them. So this is one of my favorite pieces. Now coming into here, we have all kinds of, it kind of goes from Civil War into presidential items. This is uh, um, Har uh, General Hardin's, pi Hardin's pistol and sword. Great piece, it's a presentation pistol, still in the box, fantastic. Um, over here, I want to show you, this is one of the last medals of honor from the Civil War. It was actually presented on, or, or the action was on April 7th, 1865 and um, that's on loan from his family. And we have a lock of George and Martha Washington's hair. We get into some of the commanders in chief here. Um, we have uh, Truman's hat. We have Roosevelt's keys to his desk. Ronald Reagan's briefcase. Um, a lock of Abraham Lincoln's hair that was taken, the night, or, uh, taken by the undertaker who was preparing his body. It's one of the few what we call copious hair locks that are out there. This is Eisenhower's golf clubs. Now, Eisenhower lived in Gettysburg and he played golf here and he was uh, friends with the pro out there at the Gettysburg Country Club and he gave these golf clubs to him. So this was a set he used a few times and gave them to the golf pro. So President Garfield is maybe one of the lesser known presidents, but he's one of four presidents to have been assassinated. He was killed by a guy by the name of Charles Guiteau. Well, Dad Gum, they have in here pieces of the rope that were that was used to uh, hang Charles Guiteau. Coming into here, we get into some of the World War I, World War II items. You know, Gettysburg's battlefield was used as the U.S. Tank Corps training camp in World War I. They actually used our battlefield as a, a training ground, and it was commanded by then Captain Dwight D. Eisenhower, and that's one of the reasons he decided to move back here. But we have some items from Camp Colt here. Another little known fact is the Gettysburg Battlefield was used as a POW camp in World War II. So we had German prisoners of war on our battlefield in World War II. So we have a lot of World War II items in here, a lot of items that were captured, pistols, uh, uniforms, all kinds of interesting things, Japanese flag with blood on it, um, famous Germany awake flag. And coming out here, uh, Gettysburg was visited by several presidents and we have a hall of presidents here and these are all photographs of presidential visits to Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Museum of History has one of the lar or probably the largest collection of photographic images of visits to Gettysburg. I've been looking for them for 30 years and we have hundreds of them and so we have this whole thing of presidential visits and we have a whole bunch of President Kennedy over here and then we go into this room this is what we call the JFK room and several years ago I was fortunate enough to be able to obtain the Evelyn Lincoln collection of John F. Kennedy artifacts and uh, Evelyn Lincoln was his personal secretary and she befriended a man named Robert L. White and he was a mentor of mine growing up he was a super collector he had a huge collection of really outrageously high quality historic items including the JFK collection. When he passed um, I was able to buy some of those items and um, we have probably one of the best Kennedy personal collections around. This is his suit. Um, he wore that from 1955 to 1960. In the pocket was a note to, to Senator, then Senator, which he would have been Vice President-elect Johnson. It says, Senator Johnson wants you to call right away according to Mrs. Lincoln. So he said someone had given that message to JFK, put it in his pocket, and it stayed there. Wow. And so that was found in there. And there's some photos of him wearing it. 
I have a lot of stuff from the Texas trip, the ill-fated Texas trip. There's his original schedule. Um, this is a t check that was written by him on, on November 14th. And of course, the assassination date is the 22nd. And it has a dishonored check advice stapled to it. And it says reason for return. It says return by death. Kind of a morbid, uh, poignant piece there. Wow. But one of the most poignant pieces that we have in here is we have a piece of the leather from the limousine that Kennedy was killed in. Oh my and, gosh. And it's a blood relic. You know, <laughs> it has his blood on it. The limousine was sent back after the assassination. And, and here's a little known fact. The, the presidential limousine that Kennedy was killed in was not owned by the government. They didn't buy it. It was actually leased from Ford Motor Corporation. So they had a, a White House liaison. His name was Vaughn Ferguson. And the car was sent back to Ohio to clean it because you can't just make a presidential limousine out of thin air because they were somewhat armored. They had big engines, there were specialty things in that limousine. So you couldn't just like have another one roll out right away. So the idea was to clean it, to fix it, and to have Johnson use it for the funeral. Well, that didn't happen because it was, uh, Vaughn Ferguson took it back to Ohio. He started scrubbing the seats to try to get the blood stains out. He couldn't do it because it was fine leather and it soaked, soaked through. So they had to rip it out and reupholster the car. And they also ended up putting more armor plate in and putting a bigger engine in. So it took longer than anticipated. Vaughn Ferguson had the foresight to keep a section of that leather. And the leather now, he, he, had, he had cut it into a few pieces. And um, I believe the JFK Library has a piece, the National Archives has a piece, we have a piece. And there are a few pieces out there. But the, the lighter piece there has a little bit of staining on there it's hard to see but it's there and that is the president's blood so it's a amazing piece my of history gosh that is unreal and then we have some other jfk personal items his grooming kit some of his cards this is a little drawing that caroline made in the white house with crayons and it was thrown away and mrs lincoln uh save that from the garbage can. I mean, she would empty the White House garbage can. Mrs. Lincoln had a, an office right next to the Oval Office. There's a little office there for the secretary. And things like that that got thrown away, she would pull it out of the trash can. So when we got the collection, there was approximately 10,000 documents in the files, and we still have many of those files today. Um, so there's a lot of paper items. Um, you know, JFK's checkbook, you know, writing instruments, some notes, some doodles from the Cuban Missile Crisis. A lot of neat things. And we also have some really amazing items from the aftermath of the assassination. And th these, this stuff has to do with the Dallas Police Department, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Jack Ruby. So we have Jack Ruby's suit that he wore to his trial. We have, um, the doorknob and plate from Lee Harvey Oswald's house. We have some doodles made by Ruby. Um, and probably the best thing in here is uh, this shell casing, which came from Ruby's gun. And it was saved by the Dallas DA, Henry Wade. And uh, that shell was in his desk for years and years. And um, Robert White, the former owner of this collection, was able to get it from him. We have a letter from Henry Wade. So that's like, that's the shell casing that killed Oswald. Wow. And, and it's not in the National Archives, it's not in the Dallas Police Archives, it's here. Pretty wild item. That is something else. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we, we try to keep things uh, at, a, at a PG level uh, on this channel. Uh, there, there are a few items in here that, that get to the, the PG-13, but it, they're so unique and fascinating, it, I, I have to show it. All right, well, I don't know where else you can go and see the boxer shorts of John F. Kennedy. And uh, they have a few other interesting items here, including 
Um, that was some clothing items that belonged to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> this, this is crazy. Oh my gosh, I just saw this too. I don't know how long you would have to spend in this museum to see everything, but it is unreal. This is uh, a piece of the original fence from the grassy knoll at Dealey Plaza, which of course was um, kind of one of the, the centerpieces uh, during the JFK assassination. Oh, and here's a piece of the lamppost where he was shot or close by there at Dealey Plaza. This, this is just absolutely unbelievable. So this presidential seal is the original presidential seal that Kennedy authorized to put on uh, Marine One, which was the presidential executive flight department and they, the, the Marines uh, flew part of it and the Army part, part of it. Now it's all the Marines. It's all Marines. So what would happen was they had several helicopters. I, I believe they still have this protocol when they would fly out of the White House. And there was a, a plastic sleeve basically, a piece of plexiglass. And the one that the President was in would get this seal and it's, this, it's a big piece of steel. It's painted. I guess it was done with a silk screen or something. But you can see on that photograph there, there's some of the Marines there. On that one it has, you can see where that would go. But this is the original one from 1962 that um, Kennedy authorized to put on there. Before that they didn't fly with the presidential seal. And it, this one was used from 1962 to 1964, so it was also used through the part of the Johnson administration and it was given to the flight chief as a retirement gift. And uh, another uh, historian obtained it from him and then we got it from them. So. That, I just love that, you know, it's one of those great things, it's like, uh, you know, kind of a random little thing, and, you know, back in those days, things got out, you know, today, yeah. all presidential items ends up in, the, in their presidential library, but in the JFK era, even into the Johnson era, things would be given away, you know, Johnson gave chairs away, I mean, Johnson gave this chair right here to a White House photographer. Can you imagine walking out of the White House wow. holding a chair? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, but this was also used during the Kennedy administration and Jackie had bought that chair in 1962 and it was in the Lincoln bedroom and the Oval Office for a while. Oh my gosh. So moving over here, <clears throat> this is, we, we usually call this the D-Day room, but this is also where the Major Dick Winters collection is. We'll talk about that a little later. But I'm going to highlight a couple of other items in here that are pre pretty fantastic. We have a bunch of killed in action helmets here, some purple hearts. This is, most of the stuff is killed in action, but this is something that's always fascinating to people. This is a helmet that was recovered at Omaha Beach, an American M1 helmet, and it's got the liner in there too. But it, it was underwater for quite a while and it developed sea life on it. And, and you sometimes find artifacts from Normandy like that. A, a historian I know in, in uh, Normandy got that for us. And here's a British rifle that was also found in, uh, in Normandy and it's got the same thing going on with the, with the sea life on it and there's a mortar shell that was from Utah Beach, same, same situation. Um, another neat thing in here that I, I, I like to talk about are, are these, these are trophy helmets and um, American soldiers would get German helmets and they would paint where they've been Sometimes it's a, in this case it's a memorial for fallen other fallen soldiers. All three of these are from the 29th Division. They, that was a unit that was uh, landed on Omaha Beach on June 6, and uh, I, I just really like them because each one's different. It's, it's artwork. It's soldiers expressing themselves, and I, I really I look for those whenever I can find them. Uh, moving around, this is the Dick Winters collection. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but. We have some Eisenhower items here. We have some stuff from General Ridgeway. We have Bradley's hat. Um, we have a, a, an airborne signal cricket, the famous crickets that they used on D-Day. General Patton's razor. Oh my gosh. On, yeah, <laughs> uh, in one of his books. And um, over here, 
Here's another rifle. This is a M1 Garand, I mean an M1 carbine, I believe. We don't really know because we can't see it, but that's about the size with the Sea Life on it. I think because of the ammunition in the in the uh, magazine, it kind of blew up like that. It's like it, it like corroded wow. so much. Um, so going over here, this is a D-Day uniform that was actually this is a paratrooper uniform. It's the uh, M42 jump jacket and pants, and it was reinforced um, for D-Day. They would actually reinforce the pockets and, and the knees because they learned from the Italy jump that these uniforms would tear very easily because paratroopers carry a lot of extra equipment. Extra ammo, extra food, extra grenades, and they put them in those pockets and they tear. So they, they got this idea to reinforce it with actually this tent material. So this is one that was actually used on D-Day and we know that because it has the guy's name in it and it has his blood in it and we've, we've been in contact with the family. This actually surfaced about 30 years ago at an estate sale in, in Chicago. Oh my gosh. I bought it from a very famous author and historian and it has his name, it has his name stenc uh, stenciled in the back but it has blood all over it, mostly in the back and when we found his family um, they gave us some photos. His name is Stanley Medi, and he was in the 502 Paratrooper uh, or Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne. And they told me, and we also pulled his files and stuff and found out some information, but he was wounded on D-Day, broke his foot, because they he jumped too low, like a lot of those guys, broke his foot, and then he also got wounded by shrapnel in the face, um, by, by a grenade or a mortar, and uh, there's blood on some of the pockets and going down the back. So he was evacuated out and however the uniform got out, I'm not sure, probably mailed home, but that's a true D-Day worn M42 set, which is extremely rare because they, they stopped using these after D-Day. They, they went to an, a, another model uniform. This is a German uniform that was found in a bunker in Normandy. Oh. So I know a historian over there who excavated the Crispec battery which is behind Utah Beach and uh, when they did uh, you know there was all kinds of trash in there the French used it as a dump basically after the war and they there was all kinds of things in there this was found in the stovepipe oh my god so um, I saw that about 10 or more years ago at a, another historian's house and I, I was so intrigued by that I mean, to me, that's like, you know, being a Gettysburg guy, uh, I said, I, I was like, that, that'd be like pulling a Confederate uniform out of the Kidori house or something. Yeah. yeah, I was so into this. And uh, a couple years later, he came to visit me and he gave it to me for the museum. So I was, <laughs> I was over the wow. moon about that. And it's, it's published in a book about Chris Beck Battery, too, so it's a published item. Jack Agnew's uniform that he wore as a veteran, that was, that's on loan from the family. Jack Agnew was one of the famous Filthy 13, and those are the guys that jumped on D-Day with the Mohawk haircuts. Oh, wow. So that's a uniform he wore as a veteran. This is Lee Fox's uniform. Now, Lee Fox was a Navy aviator, and he is considered the first officer killed at Pearl Harbor. So before they hit Battleship Bro, um, they, they hit the, the airbase before that, and a bunch of guys were killed there. And he was the first officer, and they actually named a destroyer after him. And he was from New Cumberland, Pennsylvania, pretty nearby here. And uh, that's his uniform. That's the telegram that his family got um, and uh, saying he was missing and then eventually killed. Now, here's the real fantastic item, I think, in here. Uh, this is Audie Murphy's uniform, and, and there's a picture of him wearing it there on that famous Life magazine. And uh, that came from the family. His first wife, Wanda Hendricks, had it, and along with a bunch of other stuff that we have. And um, we had to restore that uniform. It was actually placed in a shadow box and sewn in there. So we had some oh. we had some work to do on that one. But we got it looking pretty good, you know. And and uh, the ribbons are all his. The CIB, you know, that the patch, you know, but. It was uh, it was quite a project, but we got it we got it looking good. But I mean, it's Audie Murphy's uniform, and what what a fantastic piece, you know. And um, I I just love it. And there's some helmets here from D-Day paratrooper helmets. This is a this is a parachute. It's a reserve parachute. This is the back of it, and that is one that was found in Normandy in a barn. Oh my gosh! I was there about ten years ago, and. Uh, 
I found out about this. They found a couple of these things, and it was in a house near Saint Germain de Ver uh, yeah Saint Germain de Vereville, and there was a complete T5, and there's a couple of these reserves. And, it, and if you look at it, it says RS, it's stamped. So all the airborne equipment on D-Day was stamped with our commander's initials. So all the parachutes and uh, and uh, drop containers that were for the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment would have RS, and that stands for Robert Sink, their commanding officer. So there is a oh. reserve chute. It wasn't pulled because obviously his T5 work, they would wear one on their back, the main chute, and then they'd have a reserve in the front. And so that's still packed from D-Day. And, and I couldn't believe it when I saw that. Oh it was like such gosh. a neat piece. And there's a 506 helmet liner there and some really cool knives. And we have some stuff. I mean, we have stuff everywhere, you know, on the ceiling. Here's some really great German uniforms that are up there, looking very sinister up there. You know, we got <laughs> some SS uniforms and the famous black Algemein SS uniform. But on the ceiling, we have some flags and we have a piece of a C-47 from Normandy <clears throat> that was actually used as uh, roofing material in Normandy. And one of my pictures You've over got there. You've to be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were cleaning out a barn and they noticed this stuff and there was several pieces of it and I was able to get one of them. So that's, wow. that's a great piece. So JD, as you can see, we're out of room and we're, uh, we have stuff everywhere. So what we really need to do is expand here and that's what we're planning on doing. We're in the works right now of doing a massive expansion. We're gonna have three times the space and we're gonna interpret these items a lot better. Um, one of the plans is to build um, an annex and do a, a, a 10 vignette uh, um, exhibit on Easy Company 506 because we have so much material from them. And um, you know, the way the museum really started was of course with my family's collection, but also when I was a kid, I was fascinated by World War I and World War II and I befriended a lot of veterans and they would give me items and they would give me patches and small items like that and I, you know, literally at six years old I was collecting this stuff. When I was in fourth grade, my janitor at my elementary school was a World War II vet and I bought his collection and he had patches and all kinds of stuff and most a lot of it was German items and um, you know and that was the first time I had a big box of German stuff so I paid him fifty dollars his name is Mr. Trone um, anybody who sees this who went to elementary school with me will rem remember Mr. Trone he was the custodian there and I paid him a little bit of money each week like a dollar here fifty cents here I would mow lawn or do chores or whatever so I bought this big collection for fifty bucks and you know back then that was a lot of money especially when you're in fourth grade you know so um, that was my first big World War II collection. And I brought it home and my dad said, I don't want Nazi stuff in my house. And I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So uh, I, w with a little bit of convincing of the reason I had this stuff was the right reason and not the wrong reason, uh, he allowed me to keep it. And that, that got me going. I mean, I, was, I would go to auctions, you know, yard sales wherever I could go and I met some other dealers and so over the years I just bought and sold military items, presidential items, whatever and I built the collection that way and, and we still build the collection that way. You know we have a website GettysburgMuseumOfHistory.com we buy and sell artifacts we keep the items in the museum but we sell other items like if we get a big collection we get what we want for the museum and then we sell the other items so if you're interested in this material go to the website and check it out and um, hopefully this expansion project will take uh, will get going here soon and we'll be able to uh, have a much bigger museum all right well uh, that was a walkthrough that just shows a small fraction of what is here in the Gettysburg Museum of History. And, and what's cool is that um, Eric makes this available for everyone to see at no charge. This is, this is a free museum. Uh, so anyway, we're gonna take a few more episodes, go into a little bit more depth into some of these rooms because uh, it's, it's just something that, that everyone needs to see. But anyway, that'll be in the next few episodes.